for the first month or so of the Cultural Revolution, Mao Zedong was absent largely from the proceedings. So he had kind of delegated his Cultural Revolution and the oversight of it to Lu Xiaoqi. And Lu Xiaoqi sent out what was known as work teams uh, who were from the party, and they had a quota of about 1% of students and teachers that needed to be denounced as rightist counter-revolutionaries. And as we discussed in the previous episodes, the first month or so of the Cultural Revolution was largely people denouncing each other for their class background. So people who weren't seen as appropriately communist or people who were seen as property owners or rightist or bourgeois, these were the targets of the Cultural Revolution for the most part. As far as history goes, this is relatively standard fare for a one-party state, going out, ensuring that your party, your belief system is the only thing in town. This is something that authoritarian states have done for thousands of years. Where the Cultural Revolution takes a dramatic turn and where it distinguishes itself as unique from some of these other authoritarian programs is when Mao Zedong returns in July of 1966. Newspapers or radio or people in public hadn't seen Mao for about a month, and all of a sudden he emerged to take his famous swim in the Yellow River. He got out, he went into the Yellow River, and took a very publicized swim, kind of symbolizing his return to public life and his return as the man in charge of China. Of course, given his cult of personality and the almost religious fervor that people followed Mao with, the newspapers, the radio, the propaganda machine, and especially the students loved it, and they tried to emulate it. So many students, thousands of students, and thousands of just people in China poured into the Yellow River, whether they could swim or not. And there's sort of some ironic symbolism there that following Mao during this period and doing what he wants is going to lead to death and destruction unknowingly for many, many people in China. Once Mao is done with his public charade, he declares that the work teams that Lu Xiaoqi sent out, those party groups that were denouncing certain students or certain people of bad class backgrounds, he was denouncing them as suppressing the students. So he shamed Lu Xiaoqi in public. Also, uh, a guy named Ding Xiaoping, who will come into prominence later on in the story, and the people loved him for it. So he basically took the side of the masses against his own party, who was trying to sweep away any people of bad ideological background. Mao put out a declaration that became known as the 16 Articles, where he said, quote, Trust the masses, rely on them, and respect their initiative." Make the fullest use of big character posters and great debates to argue matters out so that the masses can clarify the correct views and expose all the monsters and demons. Be on guard against those who branded the revolutionary masses as counter-revolutionaries. End quote. What Mao has done here is he put the masses in charge of the Cultural Revolution. He criticized the work teams and he criticized anyone who criticized the masses. So the tables have now officially turned, and this is what makes the Cultural Revolution unique, because you start seeing factions develop in different areas between the people who are trying to criticize people who have bad class backgrounds, people who are trying to criticize the work teams, as Mao has said is now okay. You have people who are anti-Communist Party to begin with. You have students rebelling against authority figures. You have teachers getting into the mix, and it's very difficult to figure out what the heck is going on. Historian Jack Chen argued that people were so confused that they had to walk around cities basically looking at those dazabao, those big posters, and sometimes the posters would be up one day, they would get torn down the next day, and you basically had to walk down the street looking at the posters, trying to figure out who you were supposed to be criticizing that day or whether or not you should go hide, or whether or not you were the target yourself. So referring to the posters here, he said, quote, Some were like bombs in their effect, exploding and clearing up a situation. Some were like bazooka shells, piercing armor and the thickest hide. 
Some were grenades, even squibs. Some were artful smokescreens, end quote. The Cultural Revolution had officially shifted from simply a battle between different class backgrounds to now a shift where you have the masses against the party and the chaos was just beginning. announcement really did was it emboldened the masses to take charge and specifically it emboldened those red guard groups to revolt even further against those authority figures whether it be teachers or administrators or people who had bad class backgrounds because even though Mao had put the power in the hands of the masses that didn't mean at all that this wasn't still about class backgrounds Ultimately, this was a revolution for Mao about endless class struggle. That's the way he viewed the world, and that's the way that the people in the Cultural Revolution wanted to see the world. They felt themselves as better people than anyone who was not in their revolutionary class. And like I've hinted at before, it really didn't matter what decisions you made. So it was very difficult to grow up in a bad class background, maybe your parents were factory owners or property owners, and then all of a sudden you changed your mind and wanted to be part of this class struggle against the rightists, you couldn't do that. If you were born into a certain family pedigree, that's what you were. So one person said, quote, we are born into this world only to rebel against the bourgeoisie and carry the great proletarian revolution banner. Sons must take over the power seized by their fathers. This is called passing on the power from generation to generation. If the father is a hero, his son is also a hero. If the father is a reactionary, his son is a bastard. End quote. With Mao Zedong now firmly in their corner, and with the Red Guards not having to worry about the party criticizing them, because Mao had put the power in their hands, the Red Guards were now free to be unleashed on China, and really have total control to criticize anyone who didn't have the revolutionary zeal. The Red Guards were shifting from a student communist organization into a communist paramilitary organization. With the support of Mao, the Red Guards were unleashed on China. Here's historian Frank DeCotter talking about how the violence escalated as soon as Mao released that letter of encouragement. Quote, On August 4th, three days after receiving Mao's letter of encouragement, the students at one middle school forced the principal and vice principal to wear labels denouncing them as heads of a black gang. Over the following days, the Red Guards took turns to beat them. Some of the students used a club, others preferred a whip or a copper buckled belt. The vice principal's hair was burned. End quote. It's hard to believe, but that was a middle school. It's just hard to believe that 12, 13-year-old kids are behaving this way, but it's one of the things that makes the Cultural Revolution unique. The level of violence was escalating. Here's historian Frank DeCotter again, talking about a university this time. Quote, The vice principal had already been tortured under the supervision of a work team in late June. The students had spat in her face, filled her mouth with soil, forced a dunce cap on her head, tied her hands behind her back, and then beaten her black and blue. Now that the work team was gone, the Red Guards were determined to rid the school of bourgeois elements. In the afternoon of August 5th, as they accused five of the school administrators of having formed a black gang, they splashed them with ink, forced them to kneel, and hit them with nail-spiked clubs. The vice principal lost consciousness after several hours of torture. She was dumped into a garbage cart. When her body finally reached the hospital across the street two hours later, she was pronounced dead. End quote. The violence level was ramping up, and one of the reasons, unquestionably, is that these kids and these people who were doing these acts of torture and execution felt like they had cover from the leadership. Leadership matters, and when people in a society feel like they're going to be supported 
from the people higher up the chain of command for doing these acts of vigilante justice, they're going to feel more encouraged to do them. Listen to Mao Zedong's wife, Madame Mao, turning a blind eye to the violence and the chaos in public. Here she is dispensing her tremendous wisdom. Quote, We do not advocate beating people, but what's so special about beating people anyway? When bad people get beaten by good people, they deserve it. When good people get beaten by bad people, the credit goes to the good people. When good people beat good people, it is a misunderstanding that should be cleared up. End quote. Okay. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I think it's certainly clear that Madame Mao is certainly not discouraging the violence and the chaos that's going on in the country. And it seems like a pretty obvious statement that when the leadership of a country either doesn't care or is actually supporting that level of violence, as people are getting beaten and tortured and executed and forced to crawl across hot coals and having intimidation posters written about them in the blood of the victims. When a leadership group condones that type of activity, that society is in trouble. As August of 1966 moved along, one of the famous events of the Cultural Revolution transpired. And it was these student rallies of these Red Guards who went to Tiananmen Square in Beijing to be close to the chairman. And hundreds of thousands of Red Guards from all over China traveled to Beijing by themselves in order to take part in these rallies. And from there, they could go back out to their regional provinces and wreak all sorts of chaos. Mao realized that he could use the Red Guards to confront regional party leaders who may not have been following his directions. And regional party leaders, in turn, they were using their own Red Guards to combat the Red Guards that Mao was sending out from Beijing. And what you had was different factions battling it out in certain regions of China. All of this, of course, meant that Red Guards were constantly moving throughout China, either from the outskirts of rural China to Beijing or some of the big cities, or the opposite, from Beijing or some of the big cities out to the rural areas of China where they could implement the Cultural Revolution. As Red Guards were traveling, and particularly when they were traveling to Beijing, to learn the Cultural Revolution, be radicalized, and then go bring it back to their regional area, conditions during these travel situations were absolutely crazy for the Red Guards. To start with, they had a bare minimum of equipment. So here is what historian Frank de Cotter says that they have with them, most of them anyway. Quote, Equipped with a canvas shoulder bag, an aluminum flask, a teacup, toothbrush and towel, and, of course, the ubiquitous little red book tucked away in a pocket or rolled inside a quilt. Their most treasured possession was a formal letter of introduction, duly stamped by the local committee in charge of the Cultural Revolution, to be presented at reception centers in each city where the Red Guards intended to stay. End quote. That's all most people had with them. The train ride was absolutely packed, and it went about as well as you would expect, for a train full of kids packed in to go. People were packed in the aisles. Kids had to sleep in luggage racks. People set up shop in bathrooms on the train. Of course, you had grifters and thieves and stealers mixed in with people at the train. And as the train would stop, people would try and rob these little kids. The trains were so packed that there was nowhere to go to the bathroom. Boys were considered lucky in many cases because they could do their business out the window in many cases, but oftentimes girls had no choice but to just find a place on the train and go. So you can imagine the stench and the smell getting worse as the train ride progresses. Historian Frank DeCotter talks about these train rides. Quote, Food soon ran out, but in any case, nobody wanted to eat or drink more than the bare minimum. The toilets were always full and no one wanted to leave the train at stops to relieve themselves, 
for fear of never being able to get back on again. It was easier for the boys, who would pull down their trousers and urinate out the window while the train was moving. But it was misery for the girls. A bad smell spread as urine mixed with sweat, vomit, and excrement. Some carriages became so wet that red guards used their knives to pry open a hole in the floor. Trains became moving prisons. Sometimes wooden baggage racks collapsed under the weight of dozens of people. Doors were locked, and sick or injured passengers had to be passed on to security troops on the platform through the windows. Fistfights broke out between rival groups. Ordinary passengers took advantage of the chaos to force their way aboard without tickets. End quote. These kids went through this absolutely horrific journey to get to Beijing, only to get there and face Red Guard discrimination from the Beijing Red Guard because the Red Guards who were already established in Beijing saw themselves as better, of a higher class background, a better class background, and oftentimes these rural Red Guards had to deal with that once they went through this long journey. Of course, the city now had to deal with this problem of millions of Red Guards flooding into the city, and what do we do with all these kids? So oftentimes they were sent to live in schools. People were packed into these dormitories. There was very little access to showers or any method of bathing. So many kids went weeks without bathing. The toilets were overflowing with human stench. And the stench of feces was everywhere. The city was completely overcrowded. And food was short for pretty much everybody. One worker in Shanghai, as he was looking at the floors and the toilets and the flow of feces everywhere, said, quote, What is this? Is this hell or hollowed revolutionary ground? End quote. There's plenty of sadness in the Cultural Revolution for all of the victims, but you have to feel particularly bad for the janitors at these schools and at these places where all these Red Guards were packed in because they were in a tough spot. Many times they were jokingly referred to as the proletariat, almost as a way to say that they were even lower than the lowest. Of course, many of them came from bad class backgrounds themselves, and that justified their poor treatment. They had to stick their hands inside the toilet to unclog these massive messes that kids were leaving and just basically do their best to clean this hellhole. While that's going on, you have quarrels between different regions of the Red Guards. Brawls would often break out, thefts would be happening. Many kids, being kids, lost interest in the Cultural Revolution once they got to Beijing, and they had nothing to do but cause trouble. Steal stuff, beat people up, roam around aimlessly, If you know kids, you know that sticking millions of them in a city, essentially unsupervised, is a recipe for disaster. Did that really need to be said, or was that, that was probably obvious. There was a series of these huge rallies at Tiananmen Square from about August to November of 1966, and the communist propaganda captures the enthusiasm and the size of the crowds and the pre-rehearsed sayings of all the kids, and all the things that they were taught to say. Just an example, the teachers and the radio and the publications on the newspapers were all saying that every kid was supposed to say, quote, I am the happiest person in the world today. I have seen our great leader, Chairman Mao, end quote. But like many cases throughout history, what the government and what the media and what the propaganda wanted the world to see was not necessarily what was actually going on. Red Guards had no choice but to essentially sit there or stand there in Tiananmen Square for hours at a time with no access to bathrooms. Puddles of urine began to appear all over the floor, feces. It was really a disgusting environment for many of the Red Guards as they sat there and waited for Chairman Mao to show up. There were also voices of dissent that the government obviously did not want the public to see. Here's historian Frank DeCotter discussing one such example of this, quote, Wang Rongfen, a student of German at the Foreign Languages Institute, 
attended the first mass rally in Tiananmen Square on August 18th. She could not help but feel that the keynote speech given by Lin Bao resembled Adolf Hitler's orations at the Nuremberg rallies. A month later, she sent the chairman a letter, pointing out that the Cultural Revolution is not a mass movement. She said it was one man with a gun manipulating the people. The 19-year-old student was arrested and sent to prison for 13 years. End quote. These voices of dissent and these poor conditions at the rally were very rarely heard by the rest of the people in China because, of course, the government was trying to cover that up, but there were some things they couldn't cover up. One thing they couldn't cover up was a stampede that occurred at one of these final rallies. Here's Decatur again describing it, quote, The final rally was a disaster. Held at an airfield on the outskirts of the capital on November 16th, it was followed by a stampede. As a crowd of two million people rushed towards the only available exit, they leveled wheat fields, bent trees, and pushed mud huts out of the way. Those who tried to bend down to pick up their belongings or tie their laces were trampled underfoot. A wooden bridge over a stream collapsed, followed by piercing screams. Panic spread as waves of people were pushed into the stream, forced to wade through the shallow water. Most of it was soaked up by the cotton trousers of the crowd, leaving behind nothing but an expanse of mud. After crossing the stream, the Red Guard started to disperse, but many were now barefoot. In the freezing winter cold, every step hurt. Someone managed to grab a pair of torn cotton plimsolls. Amid scenes of pandemonium, military lorries filled with clothes, socks, and shoes sped up and down the only road. Some carried mutilated bodies. End quote. The Red Guards that were lucky enough to survive these mass rallies and these horrible conditions in the cities would then go out to different areas in China where they were allowed to travel for free. So people in towns and provinces were expected to just allow these Red Guards to come live in their houses, eat their food, and take advantage of the limited resources that were available at that time. Many Red Guards used this opportunity to visit sacred places to the Communist Party, like Mao's birthplace or the area where the old Long March took place during the Chinese Civil War or important government buildings, things like that. As you can probably guess at this point, when all those Red Guards were traveling, they weren't just bringing the Cultural Revolution with them, they were bringing disease with them especially, namely meningitis. All of that overcrowding and gross human excrement and all those kids breathing and sneezing and touching each other led to disease being spread across the country. Of course, in the planned economy, the government of China had limited medical supplies. Face masks were not in supply. Antibiotics were not in supply. And it was an absolute crisis. Frank DeCotter estimates that about 160,000 people died before eventually antibiotics were bought from foreign companies and imported into China. It's hard to feel anger at these Red Guards and these kids for what they did because they were just kids. They were brainwashed by a society and a government and a system that encouraged all of the wrong incentives for these kids. But that being the case, you also, of course, have to feel bad for the victims of these Red Guards as they got back from these huge rallies and tried to implement Mao's grand plan. Here's Frank DeCotter discussing the new wave of violence that's going to erupt after these rallies at Tiananmen Square. Quote, At the Beijing Third Girls Middle School, the principal was beaten to death. The dean hanged herself. At another middle school near Beijing, Normal University, the principal was ordered to stand under the hot sun while red guards poured boiling water over him. New depths of horror were plumbed at another middle school, this one attached to the Beijing Teachers College, as a biology teacher was knocked to the ground, beaten, and dragged by her legs through the front door and down the steps, her head bumping against the concrete. 
she died after being further tormented for several hours. Then the other teachers, rounded up as so many monsters and demons, were forced to take turns and beat her dead body. At elementary schools, where the students were no older than 13, some teachers were made to swallow nails and excrement. Others had their heads shaved and were forced to slap each other. End quote. You had people getting flogged with ropes, people beaten with clubs, children stoning old ladies. I don't want to belabor this point because I know I talked about it in the Red Scarf Girl episodes, and I know I talked about it in a couple previous episodes, but it's a broader perspective here. And I don't want to beat a dead horse. Uh, pun intended there, I guess, but imagine trying to live through that. Imagine being there. It's tough to do because it's not even a picture of society with no law and order. It's the law and order in the society is so haywire that you don't even know what to make of it. In psychology, there's something called the the foot-in-the-door phenomenon, and the idea is that if you can start slowly acclimating yourself to something. Once you do something once, then it becomes easier to do it a second time. So salesmen that show up at your door won't immediately batter you with what they're trying to sell to you. They might ask a couple of early leading questions to get you to say yes to something simple, and then hopefully later on, you're suddenly saying yes to something more complicated because You've already gotten used to saying yes, the foot in the door phenomenon. This was a justification for many people and many Red Guards who took part and later reflected on their actions. Here was one Red Guard remembering why she took part in some of these beatings. Quote, when I first started beating people, I did not quite know how to go about it. I was weak. But soon enough, I could hit harder than any other student. No matter how hard you hit, I will hit harder, like a wild animal, till my fists hurt. Children were the most vicious. For a few, beating a class enemy to a pulp became a favorite pastime. End quote. Another student said, quote, My heart hardened and I became used to the blood. I waved my belt and whipped with an empty mind. End quote. Once you get dragged into it and make your first mistake, it becomes easier to make further mistakes after that, sadly. As August came to a close, executions and mass killings in communes and villages became more and more common. Historian Eugene Wang interviewed about 500 people, both perpetrators and victims, during the Cultural Revolution, and specifically she researched the deaths of students and teachers at schools. We've gone over this theme pretty thoroughly here, but I just want to highlight one story that this historian dwells on for a little bit. She says, quote, Some teachers were forced to beat each other and were told, If you don't beat each other, we will beat you both. End quote. Folks, that's the Joker from The Dark Knight in real life. Pure chaos, pure pandemonium, pure destruction, The beatings, the violence, the torture, the disease, the bullying, the cases where the mass graves smelled so bad they had to be dug up and bodies deposited in a nearby pond instead. We aren't out of August yet in the first year of the Cultural Revolution. This thing is going to go on for years more, and thousands of people are already dead. Thank you.